I decided not to work you too hard today, Ron. <laughs> Do you like that reading? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm excited this morning. I pray that two things will happen as a result of this message. Number one, that you will be, uh, your, your vision of God will be greater than it ever was before, and that your love and excitement about His Word would be deeper than it ever was before. Because the God we serve is great and awesome. Amen? And my philosophy with our youth group is down with hype and up with truth. If we proclaim the truth to our young people, they will become genuinely excited about who God is. And a couple weeks ago in youth group, as we're going through some lessons on the core attributes of God, uh, Bria and Kevin and I have been teaching, and I got to teach on the Trinity one evening. And I never realized how exciting it could be to explore the Trinity. If I say to you, I'm going to teach you today about the Trinity, how many of you get glazed looks on your eyes? <laughs> okay, we know that stuff, all right? Now, I want you to be excited about this because God is big and God is awesome. And so I pray that you'll follow along with me. And uh, I want you to ask God to cleanse our hearts, all of us, and to open up our minds to hear what he has to say. Because we all need his truth, amen? We've been snowbound, we've been stuck in the house, we're ready to expend some energy and to engage, right? <coughs> yeah, okay, all right, let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you for your goodness and for your greatness. We thank you, God, that you are so big that you are greater than what can fit into our finite minds, but you are dependable. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you cleanse us all from our sin, help us to hear what you are saying this morning, and help us to walk away different because we've had an encounter with who you are. And I thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd bring up the PowerPoint for me. So what you're getting is what I developed for our youth group, and I decided that some of our older young people would benefit from this too. How many of you are older, young people? Okay, very good. Here we go. This message is called A Wild and Triune God Revealed. And believe me, you'll walk away thinking differently about the Trinity than you ever have before. Now, the first thing that I want to do is start with a quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, some people deny that the scriptures teach the Trinity of the Godhead on the ground that the whole idea of Trinity in unity is a contradiction in terms. Now let's just stop there and say that that is a little bit true. All right? Unity means one, but yet try means three. So trying, uh, us as humans trying to understand how there could be trinity in unity contradicts what we understand. Or it doesn't contradict what we understand. It seems to be a contradiction in terms. It goes above what we're able to understand. But A.W. Tozer said so beautifully, since we can't understand the fall of a leaf by the roadside or the hatching of a robin's egg in the nest over yonder, why should the trinity be a problem to us? Now many of you have heard me teach on monarch butterflies, for example. To this day, scientists who study butterflies their entire lifetime cannot explain how a caterpillar breaks down into mush and then becomes a butterfly. But yet we have no problem believing that that truly does happen. Amen? And that's God's natural order. So A.W. Tozer is saying, just because the Trinity seems to be a little bit above what we can rationally explain, why should we dismiss it? And basically, what he's saying is, what I put in graphical form some years ago, is that the doctrine of the Trinity does not go against our reasoning, rather it goes above our reasoning. God is not an unreasonable God, he is a God that is above my reasoning. And like I've said before, I'm thankful for that, because if Shelley Prindle could wrap her mind around God, God would be as big as Shelley Prindle. And that'd be a problem. Amen? So God is above reason. But he does reveal himself in his word, and he wants us to know certain facts about who he is. So we're going to explore this. I'm going to take you on a little adventure with me, and I'm going to ask you to do something that's really quite impossible, and that is to take your mind back to a blank slate and pretend that you've not learned anything about Christianity that you already know. 
Try to go backwards with me and pretend that you've never been exposed to God or the Bible until this morning. And I'm going to tell you certain things about him from his word, and we're going to build on that. And you're going to see how tricky, how wild, and how wonderful God really is then. So we're going to start back in the law with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Now Deuteronomy 6.4 is a famous verse because it is the main part of the Shema that the Jewish people pray. And as God is revealing himself to the Hebrews for the first time and giving his Ten Commandments and instructing us to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, he comes to us and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is... Now I want everybody to say it with me. The Lord is one. Okay? So right at the beginning, right at the inception of this whole thing, God comes out and he says to people, I am one. I am unified. I am one. Then we move into the prophets. We go to the great prophet Isaiah, who was speaking for God, and we hear God say this, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. And you get the feeling here that what God is trying to say to us is, there's only one of me. Does everybody agree? It's a main teaching of scripture. There's only one of me. So we follow him from the law. We go to the prophets. And we move, go right into the New Testament to the letter that Paul wrote uh, called Romans. And we read in the New Testament, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. So again, we get the sense that God is only one. And this scripture is a wonderful scripture that helps us to understand that there is no difference with God. There's not one God for a particular race of people and another God for another race of people. Amen? There's not one God for a particular socioeconomic class of people and another God for another. There is one God over all of us. And so whether we look at the law, the prophets, or the New Testament, we get the very strong feeling that God is one. Okay? There's the unity. God is one. Now, now please, if you can, do this with me. Try to pretend that that's all you know of God so far. You have read from this word that is his, and you have found out that God is definitely one. There are no others. Now, I say to you, then let's start at the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 1, chapter 1. We have established that God is one. So now we're going to go to the very beginning of his word, and we're going to read together Genesis 1, 1. Now, hopefully, you don't have to open your Bible to know the gist of that. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning... Can I finish it for me? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You're like, okay, this is pretty cool. There's this God, and there's only one of him. There is no other. And he wanted his people to understand that because the Egyptians, the nation that they came out of, and the Canaanites, the land that they were going to, they were all polytheistic. They believed in many gods, many forms of God, many gods, and our God wanted us to know there's only one of him. So you're like, okay, first verse of the Bible, that's pretty cool. There is one God, and He, the one unified God, is the one who created the heavens and the earth. I'm good with that. That's some good theology. Okay, let's go to verse 2 now. So to establish this one God created everything. Now we go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and something strange begins to happen. The Old Testament starts to give us some hints of something different. We get a flavor that there might be something weird going on here. Now watch this. The Bible is so exciting. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the, uh, what? Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, pretending you knew nothing about God until this point, you would maybe scratch your head and say, Okay, I have established that all throughout the Bible, God is one being. One. And now, all of a sudden, he who created the world, the Bible says that when he created the world, um, he had a what? There was a spirit about him. Now, this is bringing in another component here. This spirit was hovering, and in the Hebrew it means brooding over. 
When you were little and you were up to something bad, did you hate when your mom and dad were glued over the situation? Okay, hovering, looking, watching carefully what was going on. So we find out that even though God is one, he must have a what? He must have some type of spirit about him that he chooses to identify himself with other than just the word G-O-D. Okay? Now, it's going to get even stranger here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And I'm just trying to show you, the Bible is wild and exciting. And I'm also going to tell you what I taught the youth group that Wednesday night. Let me just digress off one rabbit trail for a minute and ask, is there anybody in this place this morning who ever talks to themselves? Proudly Ben Cox, okay, we can get some people proudly raising their hands. Thank you, Marcel. That's good. Okay, now, here's the deal. It's okay. It's really okay. For years and years when I taught high school, sometimes my students would catch me talking to myself. And I would give them a good biblical defense for this. Now, I will go so far as to tell you, I have been so known to talk to myself that sometimes to work a problem out, I hold my own talk show. I'm the host and the guest. Well, welcome, Shelley. What seems to be bothering you today? And then I'll talk through the answer. Okay, it is okay. It's really okay to talk to yourself. There's a biblical defense of this, and it's found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. But before we go there, let's review. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. How many gods are there? One God. So if you knew nothing else about the Bible, you're suddenly understanding there must be a spirit to this God, but now God's going to get even stranger when he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Who's he talking to? Nobody exists yet. This is creation. He's created the world, and now he comes to the creation of human beings, and he sits back and he says, let us make man in our image. Who's God talking to here? You can say it. Himself. And we use a, there is a plural pronoun. It's in the Hebrew. It's plural. So if you knew nothing else about Christianity, you'd stop back and say, but wait, the Bible says he's one. But there's some spiritual component to this. And now God's talking to himself? Let us make man in our image? That's weird. That would be like me going home and saying, let us eat some Drink some Wendy's iced tea. Let us drink some Wendy's iced tea. Who is she talking to? And so we get this strange, mysterious feeling that even though God is one, there's something more to him than meets the eye. Amen? Now, just in case you're not bothered enough, let's go to Psalm 33, verse 6, which is another account of creation written by David in the Psalms. And Psalm 33, verse 6, before we turn there, let me ask you the question. Who created the heavens and the earth according to Genesis 1-1? God. Watch this. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. I thought God created the world. But really it was his word that created it? This is getting stranger and stranger. There's a spirit hovering about. There are, there are actual, there's a word, there's a breath going out that creates everything. And as I said in the first service, this is just so exciting to me. Could you imagine at the dawn of history, when God speaks, he says, let there be light and there's light. And we all know that, but picture this. You like this one? Let there be rhinoceroses. And you see, I mean, I don't know what it looked like. I know that we can only imagine, but can you imagine the word comes out of his mouth, let there be rhinoceroses and all this sparkly kind of dust stuff just starts to swirl around and whoosh, there's a rhinoceros. So weird. So God created the heavens and the earth, but the Bible's really strange. This is getting kind of wild. I thought God created, but really there was a spirit there, and now you're telling me words and breath were creating the universe? What is it, God? What are you trying to say? Then we move forward into Psalm 104, verse 30, which is a beautiful passage of scripture that talks about every fish in the sea that God is taking care of and sustaining. And now something really wacky happens. So we've got God creating, we've got a spirit hovering, we've got word <coughs> creating, we've got breath creating. And now in Psalm 104, verse 30, the Bible says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created. Because now the same spirit that was back there hovering is said to be. 
be the one who's doing the creating. This is strange. But yet, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Are you one or are you not one, God? Then we move to Psalm 107, verse 20. It becomes even more exciting because whatever this word or breath is that brings rhinoceroses into being and Andromeda galaxy into being is the same word that's referred to when the Bible says he sent out his word and his word now brings healing and deliverance. Okay. Now I'm starting to wonder, is it just so simple as God created the heavens and the earth? The Old Testament is wonderful. The Old Testament is not to be left in the dust. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to what? Fulfill it. The New Testament is only 3% brand new material. It's built on the Old Testament. So what we're going to see is that the Trinity, the concept of some, uh, some plurality going on in this unity of God is presented in a fuzzy manner in the Old Testament, but it's definitely there. We start to get these wild hints of something strange going on. But what appears fuzzy in the Old Testament will be brought completely into focus in the New Testament. God is going to answer the questions that we don't clearly understand by his revelation of himself in the very beginning. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. First of all, I want to ask this question, because some of our youth were confused by this. The word Trinity, is it in the Bible? Rachel's saying. No, Rachel, Rachel's right, okay. Yeah, is the word Trinity in the Bible? Yes, no. Yeah, no, it's not in the Bible. The word Trinity cannot be found in the Bible. It is a word that we as human beings have assigned to summarize a teaching that is definitely, definitely there. So let's talk about the word itself first before we bring it into a crystal clear light in the New Testament. The word Trinity comes from two roots that mean tri-unity, which again, knocks at our brains, right? Because unity means one, and tri means three. Triangle, tricycle. So God is one, but he's also three. Trinity is a word that means three in oneness. So, I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture that no doubt you've read before, you've heard before, but I'm sure you've never thought of it this way. Because to be honest with you, until I taught at youth group that night this way and got all wound up in the kids' faces, spitting probably, I walked away with my jaw hanging open. This is so cool. All right, let's see what all this mysterious spirit, word, breath, God is one, but yet there's other things going on. What does all this mean? How does the New Testament bring it into focus? Well, we're going to go to the book of John, chapter 1. Okay? John, chapter 1. I'm going to show the words phrase by phrase on the screen. I want you to think about something with me. It's easy to remember in the future because Genesis 1.1... Let's repeat the first words of Genesis 1-1 together. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1-1. John 1-1 says, in the beginning. Okay, now let's stop there. What does that phrase mean, in the beginning? In the beginning of what? Anybody? There's like a giant classroom teaching. I know we're not used to interactive here, but does anybody know what that means in the beginning of what? Yes, the beginning of the time-space continuum. Before this, there was only God. And now God, in a physics way, decides to create the time-space continuum. So in the beginning of time, Genesis 1-1 says, God created the heavens and the earth. Now John is going to reiterate the exact same thing and say in the beginning of time was the Word with a capital W. Now the only thing that you know so 
so far as this. God is one. And you know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now you're like, okay, if in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, why does it say in the beginning was the Word? I thought only God was there. And I thought he was one. That's strange. So in the beginning was the Word. So I guess there was a Word there too with God. Oh, yeah, by the way, that's what he said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now just stop for a minute and don't take this for granted. When you use that little four-letter word with, you're implying that how many people are there? Two. Because I wouldn't say Shelly is with Shelly today. I would say Shelly is with Ron today. And it implies that there are two things in existence. I thought God was one and God created the heavens and the earth. And now you told me back in Psalms that there's some word or some breath that created things. That was confusing to me. But now you're confusing me more because now you're telling me that there was some word also there at the beginning and that this word was with God, which would imply that this word is not identical with God the Father. Now I'm getting confused. Does anybody else? Well, this is so beautiful. It doesn't go against our reasoning. It goes above this. Watch this. It gets even worse. In the beginning, yes, somebody I heard laugh. This, this gets worse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, by the way, was with God. Oh, and did I forget to tell you the Word was God? What? How can he be with God and also be God? When you imply with, you imply two separate people. But now you're telling me that they are both God? This is wacky and it hurts. Is anybody else's brain hurting? Yeah. What is going on here? Something wild, something mysterious, something beautiful that is absolutely for your benefit is going on here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now wait, it gets worse. When you think of words, you think of God speaking, and a word goes out in rhinoceros forms. He was in the beginning with God. Now, in the Greek, we're using a personal pronoun. So this is getting more confusing because this word, whoever it is that is with my God in the beginning creating, even though God is one, now I'm finding out that he is a, say it with me, person. He was in the beginning with God and all things, by the way, were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. stuff. This one God has some components to him for some reason that are pretty strange and wild. But John chapter 1 verse 14 makes it very, very clear. Watch this. You skip down to verse 14 and the Bible says, and that word became flesh. And yeah, he dwelt among us for a while 2,000 years ago. Ah. I think this is talking about Jesus. Yes, I mean. The Word was in the beginning with God. So there's one God, but He has a spirit hovering around, and He has a Word that's actually doing the work. And this Word, at one point in human history, got eyeballs and eyelashes and put on blood vessels and bones and had like hair. This word became flesh and lived. You know, it's kind of like, it's so funny here. John's kind of making like a little side note, but to me it's tremendous. And, oh yeah, by the way, he came here and he lived for a while after he made everything. And you begin to understand that this word, what the New Testament is showing us is, this word is who? Jesus. And now I think backwards and I think, oh. He sent his word and healed them. Amen? This same Jesus heals. This same Jesus delivers. Oh, this is so beautiful because when I did this in youth group, I said to the kids, so what is the truth? Did God create the heavens and the earth? And they said, yes, yeah, Shelley, he did. And I said, well, did Jesus create the heavens and the earth? Yes, he did. Did the Holy Spirit create the heavens and the earth? Yes, he did. But the Bible tells us that 
Jesus Christ, the Son, the Word of God, was the active agent in the creation of the universe. And that is why he has the right to come and to die on the cross for us and the right one day to judge us and to redeem us because he what? He made us. Is it all making sense? Surely Jesus Christ created the earth? I thought God created the earth. Right. Now, A.W. Tozer said, God cannot so divide himself that one person works while another one is inactive. In the scriptures, the three persons are shown to act in harmonious unity in all the mighty works that are wrought throughout the universe. So it becomes clear in the New Testament that the one who created the heavens and the earth is Jesus. Was the Father involved? Yes. Was the Holy Spirit involved? Yes. The New Testament brings into focus for us what God meant when he said, and can you imagine this back at the dawn of time? Can you imagine, I mean, God, I know God is spirit, so this is hard to imagine. It's kind of like the Roman sort thing. It bugs you, but I can't wait to have to find out. So God's standing back. He's made everything. He's ready to make people. And he says, let us make man in our image. And you're trying to picture the three persons of the Trinity working in perfect unity together. And when he says us, the Bible shows us clearly in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, makes it very clear that the three people that we're talking, those three persons, are Jesus Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one essence. Three persons in one unified being. That is, in the core of it, the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is something that any Christian, young or old, should be able definitely to articulate. And this is what convicts me, and this is why I chose to bring this as a message to you. If we can't articulate the basics of the Bible, then we certainly won't be living by the basics of the Bible. Amen? We need to understand who God is so that we can live by this truth. And so the core doctrine of the Trinity can be broken down into three components. And there's a quiz on the screen there that you're going to do with me. Okay? Number one. Can anybody make a guess? There is one God. That's the first thing we established. Now, even though there's one God, if you take someone through the Bible, it's a little bit mysterious how he's one being because there's other things going on there. But we know for sure that God has said there is only one God. There is no other. Number two, God is three persons with a capital P, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So even though he is one in essence, he is three persons. And, and this one is critically important to understand, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus. Very important to understand. Each of these persons is fully God. Fully God. Now the youth group should be listening because we're going to be talking about this this week and you're going to get a heads up on the answer. People try to use all kind of cockamamie illustrations to show what the Trinity is and God in the Bible never used uh, an analogy for the Trinity. Because there just isn't one that works well. But, a lot of people say, oh, the Trinity's like a three-leaf clover. Isn't that nice? No, he's not like a three-leaf clover. Because if you take one of the leaves off the clover, you only have two-thirds left. Are you with me? When it comes to the Trinity, it's the only time when 100% plus 100% plus 100% equals 100%. The Father is fully God, Jesus is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. And all three operate simultaneously. Here's another thing. It's not, we don't believe in modalism or the idea that, well, sometimes the Father operates and then sometimes he reveals himself as the Son and sometimes the Holy Spirit works. No, all three are fully operating all the time as fully God. I had the youth group draw a picture uh, a sketch of this, and some of them are artists in the sense that I am, which is bad, okay? Emily Cox, did, she's working on a pretty good rendition of that. She actually had some talent in hers. But I had them draw a sketch, and I said, let's read Matthew 3, 16 and 17, and I wanted them to realize that you see all three persons of the Trinity simultaneously in one moment. Now, this is actually the baptism of Jesus, and I want you to think of it. 
When Jesus is baptized, the physical body of Jesus Christ is coming up out of the water, right? And at the same time, what does the Bible say is coming down upon him? The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. So you have two separate, essence, two separate persons here in one essence. You have the Son is standing there in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is descending upon him. And at the same time, the Bible says that the voice of the Father comes from up in heaven and calls down, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Amen? And you see all three members, all three members of the Godhead, working simultaneously at the same moment. Each person is different, yet they share exactly the same common nature. I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture that we have, I'm sure, read and thought about many times. We always think about it in terms of witnessing. But sometimes what you need to do is take the Bible and just throw off other things about it that have been ingrained in your head and try to read it for newness, for what the Holy Spirit wants to show you about that. This is the Great Commission, and this happens right before Jesus is about to leave the earth. And I want you to see the beauty of the Trinity in something as seemingly innocent as the Great Commission. Now watch this. This is Jesus. He came to his disciples and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he stands up in front of people and says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, who's the only being that has all authority? God. So Jesus was here in this moment claiming to be what? God. He said, I have all authority over the heavens and the earth. And you're like, that's cool. Yeah, I've been taught that in Sunday school. Jesus is 100% God. Cool. Yeah, well, isn't it weird, though, that he says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? If you're God, who gave it to you? God. Weird stuff. He's God, and yet it had to be given to him. Who gave it to him? God. Which implies that Jesus Christ the Son, even though he is 100% God, chooses to submit to the Father. And Job was talking about this in Sunday school today. It's such an important point. The Trinity shows us the beauty of submission. We as hard-headed, selfish, opinionated people have a hard time submitting in families, in organizations, in churches. I gotta tell you something right now. Submission is of the Lord. Amen? And if God can submit to God, then Shelly Prindle can submit to whoever God calls me to. Amen? Yeah. That's what I thought. No amens. Now watch this. All authority is given, so he's God that was given to him. Then he says, go make disciples and baptize them. And when you do, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, there definitely is a trinity. There definitely is three persons in one essence, in one God. Now watch this. And Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Who has the right to command human beings? God. So you get the feeling again that he is God. Yeah. But this is strange. The next thing he says. He is about to leave the earth. He is about to go up in the clouds. You remember when that happened? It tells us in Acts chapter 1. They were standing there with Jesus and all of a sudden he rises up in the clouds. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that like an angel had to come and kind of slap the jaws of the disciples because they were standing there like this. Uh, what's going on? Okay? This is right before that happens. Jesus looks at his disciples before he does that, and he says, and by the way, behold, I am with you always to the end of the world. Hmm. Is Jesus a liar? Because just shortly after this, he rose up in the clouds and he physically left the earth. And the disciples were standing there looking, and the angel had to say, don't worry, guys. He's coming back. But I just have a sneaking suspicion that if the disciples are like me, the dumbhead, me, the one who never half the time listens to what God actually did say, if they were like me, I have a sneaking, sneaking suspicion that when he ascended up in the clouds, part of the reason they were like looking up was this. You just said you weren't going to leave us. Mm. 
Is Jesus a liar? Because he left. I'm going to tell you something right now. The physical body, Jesus incarnate, is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's not sitting by Regina Daniels right there. Or is he? He said, I will never leave you, even to the end of the world. So let me ask you a question. What is the only answer to this dilemma? Because we know God doesn't lie. It's the beauty of the Trinity. Who is with us to the end of the age? The Spirit. Jesus didn't lie. He had told them all along, it's to your benefit that I go, because when I go, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not be located just in one physical body. The Holy Spirit can be with all of you, all the time, wherever you are in the world. And so the Holy Spirit actually lives in me. Jesus didn't leave me. He didn't leave me, but he didn't leave me. Amen? His Spirit is with me. So let me teach say, oh, Shelly, you're just too theological with little kids. But I have a problem sometimes when they say, pray and ask Jesus into your heart. And sometimes I think, do those little kids ever wonder as they grow up, how does he fit in there? And, and I'm reading my Bible and see he's at the right hand of God the Father. So how's he living in me? And the answer is, he's living in you. Is Jesus living in me? Yeah. His spirit is. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is 100% God. So when I say that Jesus lives in my heart, I'm not lying. Jesus is 100% God, but the Holy Spirit is also 100% God. Amen? And it is really high time that the church of Jesus Christ start thinking about the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in and through us. God is one in essence, but his persons are different in function. A snapshot picture of this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, shows us that, that the three persons work beautifully. The Father is the one who plans our salvation. He planned creation and He plans our salvation. The Son is the one who came to earth, put on flesh and dwelt among us and provided for our salvation. But the Spirit is the one who protects and promotes our salvation and actually resides in us when we call upon Jesus as our Savior. Amen? The devil can't steal your salvation from you because who's got you covered? The Holy Spirit. And I love the Father and I love the Son who paid for my salvation. But I can tell you, just as much, I love the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, you've got to give him some credit now. He lives in me every day. And I'm a jerk. He deals with me every day. He sees my sinful thoughts and sinful ways and cares enough to bring me back around and say, Shelly, come on now. And convicts me of my sins and comforts me. Amen? Do you love the Holy Spirit this morning? The third person of the Trinity. Now I want to end with just giving you a few applications of the Trinity here. And I know that this has just been a very general introduction to the Trinity, but it is very exciting when you explore it in its components. Some applications of the Trinity, some reasons to understand why it's important. Number one, a lot of people say, how could God really love? The Bible says that God is love, but how could he love? Because he's so above us and so perfect and so holy. How could he love creatures like us? And the answer is so simple. Love did not begin when God created Adam and Eve, right? The Bible says God is eternal, and the Bible says God is love. So how old is love? It's eternal. How? Because God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three have loved each other in perfect unity since eternity passed. Amen? So does God have some experience in love? Yeah. All three persons have loved each other from eternity past. The other thing the Trinity does is helps us understand the self-sufficiency of God. One thing that I hate when people say, a lot of young people grow up believing this, why did God create us? And sometimes a well-meaning adult will say, oh honey, he created us because he was, he was lonely. He needed us. Hogwash. God doesn't need us. He is totally self-sufficient. God had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect relationship. He didn't have 
to create us to meet some need of loneliness he had. If God ever had a need, if he were ever incomplete, he would cease to be God. Amen? If not a person on the face of this green earth ever called upon his name or worshipped him, he would never, he would be the same as he is right now. Amen? Wouldn't change him one bit. God is wholly self-sufficient. And understanding the Trinity helps us understand that. Another thing that the Trinity does for us is helps us to appreciate unity and diversity. Now, believe me, there were days, my mom and dad will tell you, I used to go to Calvary Assembly over there in Irwin when I was a little girl growing up. And there were days before all these good hair products when my frizzy, curly, afro hair would actually cause me to cry in my preteen years and be so disturbed with my physical appearance that one day we couldn't even go to church, right? We had to turn around and go home. And I think my butt got beat or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm like the rest of you. There are times when I look at myself in the mirror, I think about my personality and the way that I am, and I think, God, what were you thinking? Why are we so different? Why does my personality rub against yours and yours against mine? And we look so different. We got different races. We got different talents. We got different. Because God is showing us about Himself. Amen? We're supposed to be different. God Himself is three different persons in one. And if God is three different persons in one and He's perfectly holy, then we can all be different. Amen? And love one another. Hallelujah. Another thing, learning right and joyful submission. I went and I taught the same lesson at Greater Length at Teen Challenge of Western Pennsylvania. Those guys there who are struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, I felt convicted to go and teach about the Trinity, and it was a wild and blessed time. But when I did, the Holy Spirit struck me with something. I wrote a devotion on it and posted it to my website because this, this struck me I was teaching them about the Trinity. We are in John chapter 16. I want to read this verse to you. John chapter 16. Jesus is speaking. He's talking about how he's about to leave the earth. And he had reminded his disciples all along, I'm going to leave the earth. I'm going to send you my spirit. Amen? When he was saying this, what struck me in verse 14, I'll never forget it. I was leaning on a podium. It was a two-hour session, and I was pretty tired. And I leaned over on the podium like, okay, Here's what Jesus said. He was talking about the Holy Spirit, and he used a personal pronoun, of course, because the Holy Spirit is a person. He said, Jesus said, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. And I remember stopping and looking at those guys. And first of all, when all those guys look at me, it's an odd situation, you know what I mean? Like, who is this character? <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm teaching. I, I, I leaned over, and I said, he will glorify me. And I stopped in my tracks, and I looked at them, and I said, wait a second. I just realized something. The Holy Spirit is 100% God. Amen? And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would make it his whole life's business to lift up Jesus Christ. Who do I think I am? God makes it his business to lift up God. 100% God, the Holy Spirit, makes it his life's business to make Jesus bigger. God shouldn't have He's God. He has every right to glorify himself. Amen? But he doesn't glorify as Jesus. And I stood there in front of those guys. I said, God, help me. If I'm just a puny, created sinner, and I think that it should be my business to glorify me or anything or anyone else in my life above Jesus Christ. Amen? If in the beauty and the submission of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus willingly, and Jesus glorifies the Father willingly, so that God may be all in all. Hallelujah. I didn't have a slide on this, but 1 Corinthians 15, 
is a bit of a mysterious chapter. It talks about the end times. And one of my favorite verses comes down to verse 28. But what precedes that is this. The Bible says that in the end, Jesus, the Son, will hand, after he's put down all of his enemies, and the last enemy that he will destroy is death, then Jesus will take the whole kingdom of the world and everything and hand it over willingly to God the Father so that God may be all in all. Amen? Does that mean that Jesus won't be all in all? No. Does it mean that the Holy Spirit won't be all in all? No. But it means that all three persons of the Trinity are working together all the time to lift up God, His salvation, and His hope. And I thank God this morning that the Father has planned all this and revealed it in this wild and beautiful book called the Word of God. And I thank God this morning that the Son came and the Word of God put on flesh and had blood vessels and bones and walked on this earth and dwelt for a while among us to die and take the punishment for our sin on our behalf, rose and went back up to heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father, and yet he sits beside Marty Rogers. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is 100% God and fully alive in the sanctuary today. And it's my heart that not only the young people of this church, but the adults of this church would grab onto the truth of God like never before. You don't need hype when you have truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen? Bow your heads with me for a moment. Father, we come before you this morning. Thank you, God. That you, your gospel is so simple that a child can understand it, but the depth of your being is so amazing. And so above reason that we could ponder you forever. And we will. Not we could, we will. Thank you, God, for heaven. Thank you for your hope. And I'm just praying right now that people, and hopefully just like me, Lord, it was me first. When I was teaching this to the young people, literally when I was done, God, you know, I sat down on that couch after everyone had left. And I just sat there and said, wow. You are amazing. And I pray in Jesus' name that through your word today, some people are sitting in the pews saying, Wow, God, you are amazing. You are one in essence, three wonderful and glorious and beautiful persons who work together in perfect unity to accomplish our salvation. Thank you, Father for planning this whole thing out. Thank you, Jesus, for putting on skin, standing in our place to bear what we could never bear, the weight of our own failure against you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us, putting up with us, and drawing us back to yourself every moment of every day. We love you. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus for whatever the need is in any heart that is here, that God, you would show by the power of the blessed Trinity that you can meet every need. And as we sing, Lord, our closing song, what a beautiful song, all creatures of our God and King. May we think of it in a way we never had before. May we sing the words about your triune nature as we never had before. The core doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ is not boring. The core doctrine of this word that I hold in my hand is the most exciting thing in this universe. And may we live by it. And may we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.